Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Hello and welcome to This Moment with Aisha Bain, human rights activist and documentary filmmaker. Welcome back. Thank you so much for having me back. It's great this, to be here. This is your second visit. Yes. The last time we spoke, it was about the great human tragedy that is Darfur. Darfur, excuse me. Mm -hmm. um, you got into that country. You went in there and made a documentary. And today I want to talk to you about everything involved with the making of Darfur Diaries. Before we talk, let's take a look at this backgrounder from Kim Skeen. This project was definitely spurred on by journalism and the lack thereof. Darfur Diaries, Message from Home, is the answer to one woman's insistence that the story of this tragedy in the Sudan be told. Aisha Bain was working at an NGO in 2003 when she was asked to look into alarming reports of conflict in the region. When she learned about the widespread violence, burned villages, rapes and murders, Aisha tried to create a media campaign. I just got responses, basically, no, not at this time. I'll ask my producer. Um, we just did a story on Uganda, basically filling up their Africa quota for the time, I suppose. Or um, basic, just we're not interested at this time. And I think basically the response was that if it's not already in the media, then it's obviously just not important right now. Aisha managed to get the interest of a friend, Adam Shapiro, who recently finished a film on Baghdad. He suggested they go to Darfur to produce a documentary. Aisha warned him of the challenges, especially the Sudanese government, which had banned reporters from the region. It's a mess in there. I'm talking to all these people. There's all the fighting's going on. You, can, you cannot get in. The borders are closed. Uh, and he said, Aisha, there's always a way in. And it was just like a light. I said, of course, I will help you any way I can. I know people. I have people there, whatever I can do. And he looked at me and said, well, don't you want to go? And I said, Abs well, to quote, I said, Hell yeah. They also enlisted the help of a third activist, Jen Marlowe, and were set to go until... Our funders pulled out two weeks before we were supposed to go. We were all set. We had our ticket on hold, waiting for the money to come in so we could just buy everything and, and leave. Um, and they were told it was too risky of a project, that we were just a bunch of kids and that we were going to get ourselves killed and that we weren't going to make much of a difference anyway. They persevered and finally raised the money. When they arrived in Africa, their experiences trying to reach the Darfurians and capture the story turned out to be fascinating and dangerous. It's not documented on videotape because their focus was interviewing Darfurians, and they had to be judicious about what they shot. There's no electricity in Darfur. There's not even a generator. There's nothing. So we had only the amount of time that we had batteries for, battery life for, to shoot in Darfur. That also meant we didn't have lights. Uh, we really didn't have, once the sun went down, your filming date was done. And once the batteries ran out, your entire film experience in Darfur was done. The filmmaker's journey is detailed in Darfur Diaries, Stories of Survival, the documentary's companion book. These pages give a gripping account of sneaking across the border from Chad to Darfur, a trip made more difficult because Aisha's contacts were not available to help once they made it to the border. So they improvised. I'm dropping all these different names of people, and this is who we know and who we're supposed to meet. We're going to Darfur because of this, this is why. And he looks at me and says, I have no idea what you're talking about. Goes back to folding his clothes. We don't believe him. Okay, but what about this and this and this person and this is where we really have to do this and we really need help and you know we know so and so we know so and so and so and so and kept talking to the man. He says, I don't know what you're talking about. Come back at four o'clock. Within a day, the rebels showed up at the UN compound where they were staying. There's a white pickup truck coming across with a bunch of guys with AK-47s and Kalashnikovs in the back, and um, there's SLA, which is the Sudanese Liberation Army. Uh, scribbled in marker on the side of the white truck and they pull up to the gate, the UNHCR gate with a guarded compound 
And uh, I look up and I'm brushing my teeth and I just went, hey guys, I think the rebels are here. <laughs> it was crazy. And that was it, they took us into Darfur. The filmmakers often put themselves in harm's way to get the story. Every time a, a plane flew over, they just heard the droning. You just see everyone disappear, and they hadn't in fact disappeared. They just ducked under any type of shaded area so that no plane overhead could see where they were. So when that when that happens, we here we were trying to film it, trying to document it, and they're trying to drag us under the trees because they're so scared. Um, and I think none of us were really scared at that point. Less than two weeks after returning home, Aisha got a frantic call from one of her contacts. His village, which they had visited, had been bombed. All of the planes that had been flying overhead that we didn't really feel were maybe that real were. It was just luck that they had not chosen to bomb that day where we were. But their own safety wasn't their main concern. We were so sure that, this, that we had to do this, and we were so, so sure that this was so important that that kind of overrided any other factor that might have happened on the ground. Aisha says her biggest fear was for the refugees. While the film may add to the journalistic record of the devastation in Darfur, Aisha says this project was more activism than journalism. Kim Skeen reporting for a moment with. Just, just a stunning accomplishment. What, when was this? What year was this? This was the fall of 2004. So you go in, you and uh, the, the two filmmakers who went with you have to be among the very few Americans who have been that deeply into Darfur. Yes. Um, Americans and, and internationals have been really forbidden behind going rev, uh, behind rebel lines, and there's been a little bit that's happened since 2004. But it, it's been a tough area to get into and gain access to because the Sudanese government forbids it, and people who are working there can't disobey because they'll, they'll, their work is jeopardized if they do. And you said hell yeah to going, but it, it couldn't have been that easy. Weren't you, weren't you the least bit afraid for your safety? Uh, maybe we're all crazy, but. Um, it was it was almost that easy by that point, maybe that's what it was, is that I had been working on this for so long um, and had been talking to Darfurians in the middle of the night, our time. I had received a tape smuggled out of Darfur that was, I mean, almost just snow on the screen, but you could barely make out some, some bombing and some smoke happening, and the guy was killed for what he shot, and they managed to smuggle the tape out. There had been so many stories and so many people I talked to at that point that I knew I could, and if I could, then I had to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and when this came up as a possibility, there was nothing became clearer than, we have to go do this. Okay. And, well, and I should say, we weighed, and everything that we, we do, I mean, we're not all that crazy, we do weigh the danger. You have to. Right. You weigh, the, you take the consequences, and you consider them. And then you decide that this is something that you can do, because my, my life is no less valuable than, than the, that refugee, or than those people that are in Darfur, and if it's possible for me to bring these stories out, then then I would do it. Okay, it goes without saying you had no visas. They don't allow. Yeah. How'd you do it? Are you, can you say that? This film would not have been possible without Darfurians. Darfurians that I met and worked with here in the States and Darfurians uh, and chat, some chattings that we met and worked with over there. Um, logistically, we had worked with um, a lot of Darfurians to figure out the possible routes and paths we could take to get into Darfur and where we would be and how we, where we could film. And um, we also worked a lot with uh, several NGOs and UNHCR, which helped give us security reports of the region and where the safest areas were to actually cross and not get caught. And the, the problem was, was that we didn't have visas, so we couldn't get caught. That would completely jeopardize the film. We weren't exactly sure what would happen to us, but that was almost a secondary thought for us. We thought we have to get these tapes out. And if we get caught, it's all over. Okay, it's all over. And so if the Janjaweed caught you, wandering and crossing the border, going into the country, much less if you had tapes on you, right. what could have happened? The truth is I don't know. Uh, they certainly would have destroyed all of our footage and all of our equipment, that I'm certain of. Uh, but what would have happened to us specifically, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. At this point in time, there are several international journalists, even one from Ge National Geographic recently, that have been arrested, detained without question, um, and the international community has had to broker for their release. I'm not really sure what would have happened to us because we're not with any major company or National Geographic or anyone to really broker for us. Uh, we had a satellite phone to try and call for help if we ever needed to. We had people who knew as best as possible where we were, but there's no real way to communicate or pinpoint us. If we had gotten caught, um, basically, I think our families would have had to say, we haven't heard from them in a long time, something's wrong, and then it would have had to happen from there.
but we had UN officials and State Department people who knew we were going in. I sent them, I sent them information when we left so that they couldn't stop us before. <laughs> you are certainly a filmmaker now, although you weren't before. Yes. Um, tell me about the two people you worked with and what was their level of skill to do this incredible documentary. Sure, they were amazing. Um, and I knew Adam, I actually didn't know Jen. I met Jen in the airport in Paris as we were meeting to fly to, to Chad. And that's when Jen and I met. Uh, and Adam knew both of us. Uh, and Adam had done one film before, previously in Baghdad, about Baghdad, uh, which is a great film. And that was his first filming experience. Uh, so he, we really relied on his guidance in terms of the best equipment to bring. Uh, we had to travel light. Uh, we knew that we needed to be able to mobile and able to run if necessary. And we found out later using um, in, in country flights with the UN that they only allow you to bring 15 kilos worth of equipment, mm -hmm. anything on you. Mm -hmm. And there's a little pink scale in the middle of this desert mm -hmm. that's in the, in the middle of this airport that's in the desert. And you have to put all your equipment on a little pink scale. And if it's, I mean, anything over 15 kilos, you have to toss it. Throw it and on. we had to have equipment. So we threw mm -hmm. all of our clothes and mm -hmm. anything else we needed out and mm -hmm. took this equipment. I, I want to go a little later into the particulars of what the equipment oh, was. Sure. But you had help from a man named Dero. Tell me about him. Dero's great. Uh, Dero was amazing. Dero was a man that we met in the small little village of Sugarcaro. He uh, had just been a teacher at the time and he spoke some English. So when we met him, we were so shocked and he said he offered to be our, our translator. But he ended up being much more than a translator. He became our guide, um, our security, uh, and one of our, uh, our, our friend. Um, and, 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 and we have a clip yeah. of Dero and I'd like to roll that Please. clip. Many people cross from here. I saw the tragedy, yeah. All the people who you saw in refugee camp in Kariari, in, in Tulum, in Riba, most of them cross from here. They work in, walking on their food. Uh, sometimes they have food, they have water. And some of them betray their way and they die in desert thirsty. Uh, many, many tragedies. I feel very sad that time, very, very sad. Many people now in Darfur suffering in his mantle, his mind, because they saw many, many crimes. Because now most, like um, many people, not normal now, because they're suffering to their mind of this problem, what happened in Darfur. Because of that, I can't tell to my kids like that stories. It's very hard. Wonderful man. Shortly after you returned, Dero's village was bombed. Yeah. Tell me about that. Uh, about two weeks after we got back, I got a call on my cell phone from a satellite phone in Darfur, and it was Dero, and he was frank frantic, and he said his village has been bombed. He was obviously really scared. People had been hurt, and could I call him back because he didn't have enough credit on his satellite phone? And in vain, we tried to call him back on this number and never got through. We didn't hear anything about him until months and months later. We found that he was okay. And just recently, um, as of last week recently, we found out that the Sudanese government is looking for him uh, based on the film and the book that they have obviously gotten hold of. And Dero didn't care. He wanted so badly to speak to the rest of the world about what was happening. He took the risk with knowing that it might be a problem for him. But thankfully, we have heard that he's escaped uh, out of the region. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does occur to me the level of courage of Dero and, and all the people who helped you Absolutely. to get this story out. Absolutely. Just, just amazing. Now, your financial backers backed out on you. Yes. Um, somehow you came up with enough money. What yes. is enough money to do something like what you did? It took much longer after that, and we had to raise it haphazardly, um, and Adam was instrumental in that. It came in $25 here from friends and family, 200 here, businessmen, um, philanthropists, humanitarians, 2,000 here. It came in piecemeal, really. And by the time it was October, we had raised $23,000, just enough for the three of us to go to Darfur with equipment, everything we needed, and to come back. Mm -hmm. And we figured we couldn't wait any, any longer to raise any more money. It was so important that we just had to leave immediately. And we figured once we brought the footage back, we could raise more money. Um, parts of my school loan paid for it. We all put money out of pocket, wherever we could get it from, to go, to go do this. At that point, it is a calling. It is, 
It's more than a cause at that point, don't you think? It's a, it's a calling. What equipment yeah. exactly did you take? I teach documentary, and I'm, I am very uh, interested in knowing what sure. kind of, this 15 kilos of equipment, what was it? <laughs> yeah, and it wasn't much. Um, we couldn't bring any lighting, obviously we didn't have equipment, uh, I mean electricity, and it was just too cumbersome. We had simply a, a Panasonic, which was our basic, our main shooting camera for interviews, and two handhelds for, for B-roll. And um, we really, we had one boom mic and that was about it. Um, and then as much batteries and tons of, um, of, of uh, tapes, and that's all we could really travel with. And there's no electricity, right? Correct. So Correct. when your batteries ran out... That was the end of the film, which is pretty much why, or at least our experience in, within the borders of Darfur, which is why we never shot us. We never really shot anything unless we, we were focusing on the Darfurians. Um, we tried one time to charge a battery off a car, off a, off a car battery, and they opened up the, the hood, and the car's held together with rubber bands. I've never seen anything like it. Um, and we, that worked once, but not very well. And mm. once the batteries ran out, we had to leave Darfur, unfortunately. It occurs to me that the logistics must have been awful, but then it wasn't as if you were able to make appointments with specific subjects. Did you kind of, the, the tapestry of this documentary, did you kind of shoot where you were because everything is so horrible? Yeah, I mean, we set things up as best as possible before we left, and that fell apart when there were peace talks at the time in Abuja, and all of our contacts were in Nigeria. So then it was plan B, and we had to set them up all over again. Uh, so we made a basic plan talking to people and finding out where we could go. Once we got into Darfur, we traveled with the rebels. They were the only ones with cars, the only people that could take us around. And we basically relied on Diro, our guide, and who knew the area really well because he was from there, and from the rebels and, people, and the drivers to find out where were some of the hardest, place, the hardest hit places, where were there people hiding that we could talk to, where, where, where could we feasibly travel to, and um, how far could they take us in. And we really relied on their generosity and on, on their incredible kindness and, and welcoming to, to help us do this project. You did have some help from the UN. You stayed at the UN compound. Mm -hmm. Did you return there every night or did you sleep in the car or on the ground? Sure, or the, what was day to day like? Sure, that was actually only in Chad um, mm -hmm. because the, there's no refugee camps in, in Darfur. It's by a different organization, a different uh, leg of the UN and we weren't close to there. So um, UNHCR and, and Kalu Doherty, who was the special representative in uh, DC, was amazing and just simply instrumental in helping us get around in Chad. We never would have been able to do it without their assistance mm -hmm. and their help. Mm -hmm. And once we got into Darfur, um, well, the UN, I should say, also allowed us to stay at their compounds, and they really assisted us with security reports and the best that they really could. And once we crossed into Darfur, then we were really on our own. Um, we had borrowed a two-man tent from some journalists that were coming from a different area. And uh, so there were three of us, and I'm, I'm 6'2", so I'm like two people. So that really, like four <laughs> of us in a two-man tent, uh, there's no way to shower uh, because there's no water for people to drink, so the last thing you're going to do is shower. Um, and you simply, we had all the food, we took everything we could with us. Uh, they were so incredibly kind with sharing everything that they had, even though we really didn't want to take it, but they were just so warm and so generous. They had nothing, they gave us everything. And um, we, we counted on, on, on all, of their, all of their guidance. And um, it, was, it was an amazing journey. Um, there were times where I think we felt maybe the most danger were, was on some of the cars, traveling in these cars that seemed to pitch in the middle. They didn't know where they were driving. It was really fast. They would sometimes they would almost pitch over, they'd stop. Um, and then the other danger was really the, the planes overhead um, mm -hmm. that we didn't, I think, realize at the time. When we went there, there had been no bombing in that area for about four or five months. Some, Reports were conflicting, but that had been about the average. Mm -hmm. So when we saw the planes flying overhead, we figured there was no real danger. And two weeks after we left, the very village where we had been staying in was, was attacked. It occurs to me that even for an activist, or several of them, that this is a life-changing event. Yes. To have gone into to that area. Yes, all of us, um, Adam, Jen, and myself, have all worked in areas of conflict. Um, and all different parts of the world. So I think we all of us had had that life-changing experience long ago, but this was an additional one, certainly, and about things I'd like to do for the future. I mean, I, doing this project was absolutely amazing, mm -hmm. and uh, I am, I'm still affected by it. I think all of us thought it would be a short-term project. We thought we'd go, we were in the region for about a month, we'd you come back. In country, how long in country, in Darfur? We were in Darfur for about 10 days before all our batteries mm -hmm. ran out, mm -hmm. and um, in, in the rest of the time in the refugee camps in Chad. Mm -hmm. And uh, we thought we'd come back, put the film together in about two or three months, get it out, and be done. And we had no idea what this would actually take. 
Uh, and so when we got back and using Final Cut Pro on Adam's Apple computer, we worked, uh, I was a full-time student at the time, Adam was a student, Jen, you know, stopped everything she was doing to work on this project, and we worked day and night on this, on, on, on putting this together, on cutting and everything we could do and going through, first of all, I should say, 45 hours of footage. 45 hours. With, uh, we found some Darfurians that worked in BWI in Baltimore. We found a bunch of Darfurians who are cab drivers in Brooklyn. Did you find some more money? Well, we, yes. We did find some more money. It came in very slowly, though. And actually, what, what had to happen was we had to basically go in debt and get some proceeds from the film now to pay for uh, some of the expenses that we came out of pocket. But um, we found Darfurians all over the place who helped us translate all that footage. And actually, funny stories came out of that. Um, we didn't know that some of the translation while we were there had been really off and that Darfurians had been speaking about us uh, at the same time that they had been, uh, had been talking because the, of this mic they'd been traveling with and they would be saying, all oh, those white people, they will get tired, we must stop here, and all oh, these white people. And um, <laughs> it was really, really funny, the experience. But it was a long time and we finally finished the film actually a year later instead yeah. of three months like we thought. Did they think you were white? Yeah, well, actually, no. Yes and no. They thought... Um, but for the most part, they would call me their sister. And I was like, yeah, hey, I'm their sister. But um, it was a, a hodgepodge, the three of us, um, as you saw, I think, in those photos. I'm 6'2", and, and, you know, <laughs> black, and I speak French. And then there's Adam, who's like 5'9", or 10, and he grew a lot of facial hair at the time, and was really dark. He looked Arab, and he speaks Arabic. And there's Jen, who's like 5'1", and speaks a, a broken French and Arabic. I mean, we look like a circus walking through, and I think that probably helped us break in to they talk to people. They probably didn't know what you all <laughs> like, were. Who are these people? Yeah. Um, it was <laughs> that's, amazing. That's, that part is funny. We talked uh, last time you did the show about the unimaginable human tragedy that is Darfur, and I don't, I don't want to really revisit that to a great extent, mm -hmm. but I do want to talk a little bit more about the, the SLA, the, um, the rebel army, and what they have to fight with, and we have a clip of some of their training. I want to roll that clip, but first uh, set this up for me a little bit. Sure. Um, this actual training that you're going to see is actually in a camp um, where they have a lot of uh, young soldiers, uh, a lot of children that had nowhere else to go or that were angry and fled to their camp. Um, they are insistent that these children are not fighting. We were unable to document anything to the contrary, so we are unable to confirm or deny that fact. Um, but they have a training camp. They train every day, and they have plenty of um, equipment. Um, some of it looks like it's old as time, but it's functioning. And uh, this clip will kind of okay. show you what they're going through. Let's take a look. Back to our uh, camps. They are participating in uh, activities inside the camps and uh, helping in and this uh, civil side of our, uh, our uh, movement. They are not participating in, in war. And we are keeping them because they have no way to go. Uh, they don't they don't look like a well equipped army. Mm. It's I mean they when we met with some of the leaders of this movement they told us how they came together and it was kind of like a brave heart. A few guys came together, attacked a police station, got some um, weapons, some other guys heard about it, ran over and joined them, they attacked more police stations, and then finally the conflict started when they attacked that military base and destroyed eight planes because they were tired of mm -hmm. being bombed from above. They figured if they destroyed the planes, they would stop, stop the bombing mm -hmm. and stop the killing. You did actually talk to some of the leaders. Absolutely. And, and how did you manage it? Did they present themselves to you? Uh, Obviously, there were dangers in that for them as well. Yes, as we mentioned, uh, we were, as I mentioned, I was traveling. We were traveling with the, this rebel group, the SLA, the Sudanese Liberation Army, and um, they. We asked if there were leaders we could meet with, and they agreed. We told them exactly what we were doing, and they fully agreed to to talk to us and to tell their side of the story. Uh, I think some people criticize the film because they say it's so one-sided. It's only Darfurians, only the SLA, and why didn't we talk to the John Jawid, and why didn't we represent the Sudanese government? And there's two things to that. One is that, again, we couldn't get caught. Uh, and two is that, at that time that we went, the 
government of Sudan had so much voice in the media, had so much presence. They were always saying their side, that this wasn't happening, that they didn't have a role, that there was no rape, that there was no conflict, that it's black versus Arabs, it's a tribal thing. They had plenty of voice to deny their role and to, to state their, 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 their perspective. And so we wanted to give a voice to a side that didn't have that voice and didn't have that role at that time. Well, how can you say that, that, that authority that's slaughtering children has a side? My idea about documentary is that it doesn't have to be fair and balanced like a news package. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, don't get me on my soapbox here. <laughs> you know, some things are not arguable. Where has where has the piece shown uh, been exhibited, and did you offer it to those news outlets that were the inadvertent cause of your making the film in the first place? Yes, um, and it's been shown all over the place. Um, it's been shown a clip of it to the to the UN Security Council, to the State Department. Um, it's been in film festivals all over the world, and that can continuing, which we are very pleased about to give it an international viewing. Um, it's been in universities, actually, all over this country. It's been a great venue for us, and people who asked us to come, to ask to come bring it, we, we, of course, we travel there. Uh, the news outlets we have uh, approached them and, and told them about this documentary, and at the time when we were finished with the film, there still wasn't that much interest um, in it, and that's now changing. We've gotten, uh, it's been on PBS, and we've gotten more interest from Good. some other bigger stations that are now realizing that Darfur is still not only such an issue, but getting worse, and that they want actual footage and stories from the region. Um, you said it's getting worse. What is going to happen to Darfur? Will a whole tribe or race of people be wiped out before this is over? Um, what's going to happen? I'm not sure. But will these people be wiped out? I'm think... confident that they won't. That, that these, mm -hmm. certain, these tribes that are being persecuted, that, that these people who are being chased off their lands or whatever, or you know, being killed, um, they are in a horrible situation, which continues to grow worse. They are suffering greatly, and they need help. Um, but they will not be—they will not be extinct. They will not be wiped off. Uh, they are fighters. Uh, they exist in, in strength and unity, um, and they are—they have support from amazing different organizations around the world who are trying to give them voice and trying to work with diplomatic efforts and, and different security efforts to, to stop this mm -hmm. conflict. But no, I, from the Darfurians that I met, from the ones I know here, they will survive somehow, but the situation will, the needless killing, the deaths of these children, uh, rapes of women, uh, these killings of whole families, it, that doesn't need to continue if we can avert the situation now. Your work there spawned a book, did it not? Yes. I think we um, have a, your cover in um, Tell Me Darfur Diaries, Stories of Survival. For any of our viewers who would like to read that, how can they do so? Certainly. It's in many bookstores now across the country. It's also on uh, Amazon.com, BarnesandNobles.com. Um, and if they like, they can just ask their local bookstores. They can request that they order it, and they can be available in their local bookstores as well. Um, and it's this part, the book, the film tells the stories of Darfurians, and that was very specific to, for our goal. But the book kind of tells more about our stories as well. There were a lot of things that happened to Jen and Adam and I while we were traveling, and crazy stories, and a, lot of, a little more political analysis and other rooms for other, other information, and that's in the book as well. We have less than 30 seconds. What's mm -hmm. next for you? Um, there's a school project that we're doing with the proceeds of the, big, the, the book and the film. We are building schools in Darfur, and if you purchase these items, you will help rebuild schools and help send children to school in Darfur. Thank you so much. Thank you. Aisha Bain. And thank you for joining me for this moment with Aisha Bain, human rights activist and filmmaker. I'm Lee Thornton. We'll see you next time.